All right. Thank you all for joining us for a Great Lakes Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center presentation this afternoon, late, late afternoon, early evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you all for being here. Um, today's session is following our uh, video presentation, a part of our Youth Mental Health and Social Success series. It is supporting authentic communication and advocacy to enhance engagement. Our session is hosted by UW-Madison Division of Extension, which is one of our uh, six partners for Great Lakes Rota RC. Today's, uh, I will be your host today. My name is Amanda Kara. I'm the Technical Center's Regional Project Manager. We do have a couple of quick things to go through before I hand you over to Anna. Um, so if we just proceed forward onto our next slide, I'll just quick touch base on our funding acknowledgements. We are a SAMHSA funded project. We cover the uh, uh, HHS region five, which covers those states you see there, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. But don't worry if you're here from outside that region, we're happy to have you. We love seeing everybody here. Um, so thank you for being here wherever you're coming from. Our website is linked there on the um, slide, but we'll be putting it into the chat later on in the presentation. Don't worry, we want you to keep coming back. So we'll make sure that you get all of our platforms uh, to make sure that you can continue to connect in with us. As part of our project remit, we make sure to provide virtual and or on-demand education evidence-based resources and research, as well as technical outreach to professionals working in and with rural communities. Moving on, we wanna just give you a quick look at one of our uh, websites pages, and that's our resource library. Might look a little different than this. We're doing some website redesign, uh, but this just give you an idea of kind of what we look like. Uh, so we want to tease you a little bit. We want you to go check it out. Um, but on our resource library, you can see information that connects to our partners like the TTCs, SAMHSA, um, their community toolkits of resources, videos, podcasts, supportive apps, and much, much more, as well as upcoming training and events. We'll, talking, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that at the very end of Anna's presentation, what to expect more in this series uh, and some other stuff that we have coming up. Uh, moving on, let's just talk a little bit about what to expect and how to create an environment as we move into our presentation today. So as we get ready to listen and engage in the session content, let's just take a moment to promote the use of affirming. Um, we talk about person first language and it's going to talk about something a little bit different um, when she sets her session. Um, but we want to when we move into that uh, talking about health disorders, we want to create that environment of learning together. We want it to feel welcoming and safe for everyone. So let's work together to manage a space that supports non-stigmatizing recovery oriented language that can help reduce negative bias and promote engagement. As always, we invite you to learn about successful prevention, treatment and recovery from whatever space you're joining us from today. And we welcome you formally into the Great Lakes Rota RC Community of Learning. Remind you to try and keep your um, uh, audio on mute if you can, uh, unless you're going to ask a question, uh, you can type it in the chat if you want. We'll monitor the chat and we'll help forward that to Anna if, it, if she's presenting and we'll work with Anna to find spaces to uh, to get those questions to her. I'm going to hand it over now to, to Anna uh, to uh, welcome her into our session and into her capable hands. Thank you. Um, so as Amanda said, this is supporting authentic communication and advocacy to promote engagement. Um, I wanted to start with Jordan's video because I think hearing her voice um, just really sets the stage for why this work is important and how as providers and educators, we can try to be something different for students um, comparatively to the experience that she had. So. Um, First, I just want to kind of go through what we're going to be doing together in our short time. Um, quick introduction, quick identity first language disclosure, um, quick grounding activity, and then we'll get into kind of the topic discussion. And then I think at the end, there is a hosted question and answer time. Um, and there's three things that I kind of just want to make sure that I, or I hope that you get out of this today, just thinking about alternative perspectives and communication styles, um, understanding what expressive and receptive communication is and how we can support it um, 
in our daily activities and our daily um, work that we do. And then reducing the need for masking, really trying to support and affirm the individuals in front of us. So um, I know that some of this might be familiar for people and some of this might be um, brand new information. Um, but either way, I'm hoping that again, with that shared experience of the documentary together, we can build on that knowledge and kind of um, enter into some important conversations and work. Um, I just want to note, I'm always trying to model what I think is best practice. So I know when we go to presentations, a lot of times we um, expect to see learning objectives and agenda. Like and as an adult learner, I want to know what I'm going to be doing and what's expected of me. But oftentimes in classrooms and community spaces and therapy, we um, forget to do that. And we forget to visually kind of... Um, outline what might be happening, right? We do it We do it verbally, but we know that when um, brains are in a state of trauma or dysregulation or anxiety, the ability to process language is tricky. And so um, it's so calming to have the who, what, where, when, and how long. And it's such a low stakes way for us to kind of give um, information and increase um, someone's kind of connection and ability to engage in and comfort in whatever activity or learning space you're trying to do. Um, and it's, people might not need it every time. That's the thing that I hear a lot is, oh, they didn't need that yesterday, right? But depending on the activity, something that's new and novel might be, need a higher level of um, kind of outline versus if this is something you do all the time and it's part of a daily routine, you might not. And so um, I know that that can be that can change. Um, and so I just like, I think about what does this currently look like in your practice? And this isn't something that you need to put in the chat, just kind of thinking about um, what might be, you be open to changing, right? What are you already doing for your clients or your students? And then what could that look like moving forward? So a quick introduction. So similar to the, who, the what and the when and the how long, um, kind of knowing who you're connecting with or who you're learning from can be really comforting and so and can kind of increase the learning. And I think an unfortunate reality for the population we serve is sometimes the adults and the support staff and the care um, workers are changing all the time, right? And so any way that we can try to kind of foreshadow and increase people's kind of comfort with who, who they're sharing a space with can be really helpful. So um, you might hear students in the background. It's um, it's it's forensics day here apparently, um, and so I do work in a school. And I was a, a early childhood speech and language pathologist for um, a while, and then I switched roles to be a program support teacher, working with um, mostly with teachers and parents of autistic children, and. Um, and what I've noticed in those two roles was as an early childhood SLP, it was really important to me to be providing multiple modalities so kids had a way to communicate. And that's why I really um, connected with this, this documentary. I just felt like it's so important for everyone to see and to kind of feel the why of the work, as well as then when I switched roles to be a program support teacher, I was being called in to help problem solve around things that I felt like weren't the child to be solving or working on, I kept thinking there has to be a way that we could change our environment or our universal supports or our designs to make this environment fit the child, right? Um, and I think that, you know, we start to question, you know, and get curious about what is the problem? And that's kind of what we heard in the documentary as well, right? How can we start to get curious about um, centering the autistic perspective and really learning from people with lived experience to inform where we're going. Um, and currently, I would say that systems and schools and environments aren't set up for neurodivergent learners. Um, and there's really there's real impacts to that. And I think, again, the documentary did a really nice job of highlighting that. Um, and it really ties to the mental health work. Um, and so as an ally, though, I always like to say, like, I'm just one perspective, and it is really important to me to center the work of autistic um, researchers and individuals. And that's why, um, in thinking about hosting this topic, 
it was really critical that we start with Jordan's voice, that you start with the voice of someone with a lived experience and hear their their advocacy, um, and then for us to build on that. Um, and I just think that um, the strategies and the things that we'll talk about today are from a lot of people in the field, and they're things that I feel like are effective and efficient and we can use in our daily practice. Um, so again, modeling a strategy that I want to do for our learners or, or clients or whomever you may have of kind of what is expected from them in a learning environment. Um, this is hard, right? So being in a virtual space, I really like to share spaces with people. So this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, but um, I like to know what's expected of me as a learner. And I like to make sure that the expectations are really clear. So I had a student say to me, I don't want to go to that class because there's a lot of unspoken expectations. Right. So they're advocating like, I just don't know what to do there. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. And so I can't enter that space. Right. And it feels like hmm, that is something we could change. Right. We could clarify those expectations and maybe we get that student to participate. So make sure today you take care of yourself, um, whatever it might be, you know, fidget, sensory regulation tools, the bathroom, water. Make sure you take care of yourself as a learner. It's my goal that this is a comfortable learning space. So um, as Amanda alluded to, I'll be using identity first language today. And this is really um, in response to the autism community and um, the autistic advocates and what they're calling for. So um, what we're hearing is that they are saying this is, um, you know, crucial to our neurology, which impacts our sense of self and our lived experience. It's all impacted by neurology. So it's central to the year, their identity. Um, and so I, as somebody who's trying to be responsive to the group I'm supporting, will always default to identity first and um, autistic. But I will, when working with a family or a student, ask their preference, right? So when I'm speaking to a group like this or in um, an email, I might be using that language. But when I'm working with a, a student or their family, I, I ask them. Um, also, today you might hear me switching between students and clients. I It's my default to say students, but I know a lot of you um, serve um, the autistic community in a different way. And so I'm going to do my best to do both. And then um, last, before we get into our topic discussion today, just a quick um, grounding activity. So this was something that I learned this summer at a professional development opportunity and um, just talking about how as providers or how people who are experiencing trauma, it is so important to ground ourselves throughout the day. And many of you already know this and you might have many better um, tools, but I just like to bring it in again as a modeling for things we can do um, for those that we serve, but just breathing in for four, holding for seven, and then breathing out for eight. And the reason that I like this um, kind of grounding activity, mindful breathing is you can do it anywhere. Um, I'm a district-wide employee and I run around all the time and I have a very busy brain. And so I can do this as I'm walking into a meeting. I can do it during a meeting if I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable or nervous, or if I'm with a student having a hard time, I can do it without them knowing. And it's a way for me to stay calm and so that I can support the co-regulation of the people that I'm around. Um, another reason I like this tool is it might be one that students are willing to use. A lot of times I will suggest a strategy or will kind of come up with a plan and the student will say, I'll never do that in front of in class. I don't want to look different. Right. And so that references masking, which we will talk about. Um, but anything that we can do to help regulate our students in a way that makes them feel comfortable is something I want to do. So I invite you today, if you have, if while you're following along, to try breathing in for four, holding for seven, and breathing out for eight. And if you don't want to do it, that's totally fine too. Um, but yeah. You heard Jordan talk a little bit about feeling connected and feeling safe and what adults could do and provide to help make sure that their students have that sense of, of safety. And so... Um, this brings to mind a term that's being talked a lot about right now, um, and it's from Dr. Porges, Porges, um, yes, and um, I really learned about it from Mona Della Hook's book, um, Beyond Behaviors, which I recommend to 
anyone and everyone. And I know that we'll be putting together a toolkit at the end of this and, and a reference to that will be will be in there. Um, I think she does a really great job of kind of explaining the why it's important for us to be thinking a book, I mean, about um, this different, about behavior different. And I think Jordan really helped give us a shared um, understanding of that here as well. But neuroception at its core is the process by which our nervous system evaluates risk without requiring awareness. So our students are constantly assessing threat in their environment. And when they feel like they are, um, when there's threat in their environment or they're not comfortable, they're not in a space where we can engage and connect and learn or teach. Um, and instead they're just trying to keep themselves safe. And so um, a lot of what we're talking about today is how can we as providers or teachers create spaces and places where the sense of safety is, is strong and students can, can enter in that learning space. Um, and I think the other part of it that I really like is it draws our attention to that, yes, we can think about behavior as a, a tool or a form of communication, and we can think about behavior as a stress response. And I think when we, when we think about it as a stress response um, versus just like a compliance issue or something like that, we it changes our mindset and it changes the way that we're going to approach or move forward in supporting it. And so while you know you might be listening to this and think stress response, behavior, form of communication, it's kind of semantics, I really think having the right language is fundamental in our mindset and really thinking about support versus compliance. Um, and I think again in the in the documentary, Jordan showed us, right, when she felt connected and validated and her needs were met, right? She's in a dark room, in a swing with a dog, and no one's talking to her. Um, her engagement shifted. All of a sudden, she was communicating the why behind why she had been dysregulated versus um, just running out of a building and adults thinking she was being naughty. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, so again, I think it's really important we take a few minutes to kind of ground ourselves in the terms of the language we're using today um, so that we all have a shared understanding. Um, and neurodiversity is the first word that I kind of want to draw our attention to. It's that simple idea that there is a lot of variation or in the way that the brains work or process language and that there's a place for all brains in our society, right? There's strengths to every kind of brain. Um, and we want to reduce the stigma and we want to focus instead of fixing on um, connection and education and communication and engagement, right? And so, um, and regulation. So we're just, we're shifting um, it when we think about it through a different lens. So neurodivergent is a word you've heard me use and I will use again, but it references a brain that processes um, language or the world, sensory information, whatever it may be differently than what society has kind of deemed normal. And I put normal in quotes because I think it's really important that we're aware of who's determining what's normal, um, this idea of ableism, and how do we, how are our systems set up, um, and which brains are they prioritizing, and which ways of learning is being prioritized or rewarded. Um, and then neurotypical references a brain that's considered to process information as expected, right? Um, and I always just really like to say that neurodivergent does not mean bad, broken, wrong, right? And it doesn't always need to be fixed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Also, I think neurodivergent um, is often used kind of synonymous, synonymously with autism. And it's really important to know that it's not only referencing autism. It is referencing brains um, that, uh, you know, experience ADHD, have experienced trauma, um, other things like that. So the, it, it's a larger um, kind of framework for understanding brain um, differences. And um, kind of going in then to the next slide, that idea of what is normal and what needs to be fixed or how do we need to, like, 
what do you need to be like for your brain to be recognized and reinforced positively? There's the medical model of disability, which is the more traditional model. And, you know, thinking about brains in a more deficit based way um, and centers the work around fixing or curing autism. Um, and the social model of disability is looking to kind of it acknowledges that there are real um, difficulties and some barriers with disability, right? There are impacts on daily living, and but it looks to lessen those or decrease the intensity of it by trying to um, create more universal supports and expectations and kind of teach people around the people with disabilities um, ways that they can accommodate so that those with disabilities aren't doing all of the work. And that's how it has been more historically. Um, and so I think that in schools or wherever we might be, it's considering what is our behavior as adults um, that we can change or how can we set up the environment in a way that allows the student to have to do less work. We're kind of meeting the student in the middle where they're at. Um, and so I always want to look at environments and I want to look at spaces um, and I want to look at processes before I look at the intervention or the skill that we're going to teach the student. And this is a little bit of a can be a little bit of a shift for people. Um, and I know for me that that was the case in, in my current role. It was looking people looking to you to this kid is having this problem in my class. Can you come fix it? Right. Versus getting curious and starting to ask them some questions about adult behavior. Um, which is can be a new kind of way to think about it. Continuing to define some terms, non-speaking. Again, if you were here with us live today, right, you're going to have that shared experience of the documentary. Um, but I think, right, it's somebody who does not have reliable access to verbal communication. So there are some people who identify as like minimally verbal or non-reliably verbal, so they have access to verbal language, sometimes in some spaces and at some regulation states, but not at others. And so, um, and other people don't have any um, verbal communication. Um, another way that people are talking about it is um, mouth words, because some people are using verbalizations in other ways. Um, so you might hear that as well. Um, and then, support needs. So I think many people are, you know, high functioning, low functioning was a way that people described other people for a long time. And at the end of the day, it's just not as helpful in um, helping teachers or parents or providers kind of understand the strengths that a child has, and then the areas of which they would benefit from some support. And so um, that thing that I really like about support needs is it allows us to really highlight the things that a child or a student or um, a client can do independently or more autonomously, and then the things where they can benefit from support. And the things that they need support with or the skills are areas that we're going to want to make sure we're, we're targeting either in accommodations and modifications, or that's where we are um, kind of writing goals and thinking about our interventions. Um, and last, this idea of masking. And it's the idea of suppressing behaviors or your own needs in order to kind of fit in. And this is something that people do a lot. And it's that idea of like, I'm going to prioritize your comfort over mine in order to be accepted or respected or welcomed into a learning space. Um, and we just, we know that there are mental health impacts for that. And so trying to create universal spaces or create some spaces where students can be their authentic selves and feel confident in that and feel like they're getting feedback um, is really important. And so just a quick visual kind of for masking. Um, and I just wanted to um, put this on there again in the toolkit, Dr. Neff's website will be on there, but just um, gives you a couple of examples um, of what masking might look like. Um, and it's that idea of you're maybe mimicking others or like, again, you're suppressing your own needs or you're um, trying to copy and get it exactly right because the social norms might not make sense to you inherently. Um, and so you're just doing your best to try to like piece it together. Um, and again, it's a very simplified um, example of what masking is or a description, but 
um, going to Dr. Neff's website is just would be a great, she's just a great article and um, post about that. And also references a, a tool that I use a lot for older um, students. So 16 and older in um, 2019, uh, Laura Hall and her research team created the Camouflaging Autistic Traits Questionnaire, the CAT-Q. Um, and this is an assessment tool that's free, which I love, and you can do it online. And um, what I like is it looks at autism from the internal experience. So often when we um, are assessing students, we're asking parents or we're asking caregivers or asking teachers and they're filling out questionnaires. And the reason why I think this tool is really important and again, kind of fits with what we're talking about today is it's a tool or a way for us to gain the insights from the individual on what it is that they're doing in their environment to either mask or not. Um, and again, really trying to understand masking and how often your student or client is feeling like they have to pretend or not be their authentic self is critical in supporting their mental health. Um, in creating safe spaces, presuming competence is just like the most important thing. And uh, Jordan just does such a wonderful job of illuminating the why for that, that um, I don't feel like anything that I would say today is going to be better than what you saw from Jordan and, and why that's just so important. I, I agree. The first time I watched the documentary was very emotional for me. Um, and I was like in a room with a bunch of other people. So the fact that you got to do that in the privacy of your home today is, is great. But I think the idea that all humans have the potential to learn, and this is where I think sometimes we get a little confused, especially with augmentative and alternative communication, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but that was that multiple or that way that Jordan was communicating using the device and alternative means, was that presuming competence doesn't mean that you think that they already know everything, right? We know that any seventh grader with whatever kind of learning needs doesn't know everything. Um, or high schooler, or any human for that matter. But it's presuming competence means we think that you can learn, you have the capacity to learn, and we are going to use strategies to help you learn. Um, and so especially with communication devices or communication tools, um, we have to, we can't just provide it and say like, oh, they're not using it, right? We have to think, what, what is the teaching that we're doing? Because we, I believe in you as a communicator. I believe in you as a learner. Um, and so um, I'm going to take the time to con keep figuring it out. Again, I'm going to go back to that phrase of like, get curious. What is working? What's not working and why? But I'm not giving up because I know that you have a lot to say. Um, and again, this mindset matters and helps us kind of shift from some of the more historical narratives that weren't as strengths-based to thinking about students as really, really capable and worthy. Um, and so in a, like a reflection ideas, right? Thinking about the documentary, it was clear that many professionals across many settings did not presume competence um, and there were not equal opportunities um, available for all learners. And this is a reality for many students in our educational system today and needs to be something that we continue to like challenge. And that's where those are the questions that I keep coming back to every time is, is getting curious about why the student's not engaging and how we can get them there versus saying they can't or they won't. Um, And then I think the reason, oh, the last thing, sorry, that I wanted to include about this was I included this stairwell um, visual very intentionally. So at my very first professional development as a um, new SLP, I got to see uh, Paula Kluth, who is an inclusion specialist, and she used the kind of phrasing, what is the entry point for participation? What is the entry point for su su success? So students start at all different levels of the stairs, but we have that goal that they can get to the same point, and it's on us to figure out what we need to do from an intervention standpoint or an accommodations or modification standpoint to make them feel safe enough to start. And then once they've started, what scaffolds and strategies um, can we use? 
And so that like the students won't do it or can't do it, we're getting curious. Okay, so what accommodations have been tried? Are there multiple ways for kids to demonstrate what they know here or participate? Is it accessible? Is it at their reading level? Um, has it been tied to an interest area or, um, and, and I just think so often we have a, a more narrow way of what participation will look like. And when we broaden that and make it more inclusive, we're going to get engagement at a much higher level. Um, and, and I on purpose chose a um, visual of the stairway with a railing because I think like what an example of a great environmental support, right? Like if you, for there's some people with mobility issues or balance issues or fear of heights or whatever it might be that without the railing, they might not go up the staircase, but with the railing, it now feels accessible. And so it's kind of thinking about that um, from a therapy or an education standpoint as well. So in continuing to think about presuming competence, Jordan, again, said it just so well, but talking to students in an age appropriate way. So the right intonation, the right speed, the right volume. Um, sometimes people with disabilities are spoken to at a higher volume or slower or, um, and I think there's that balance, right? We're saying allow processing time. Um, that doesn't mean you're speech necessarily needs to be slower. It just means that you need to talk less. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, in a minute as well. But making sure it's age appropriate. Is this how I would talk to another seventh grader? Is this how I would talk to um, another 20 year old? Is this who, am, am I presuming competence? Am I speaking to you as a human and as how I would interact with others? Or because of my knowledge that you have a disability, Am I speaking to you in a different way? And that's just a reflection that everybody has to, to kind of do. Um, and, and you can check yourself. Sometimes you might start a conversation one way and think like, nope, that's not how I wanted it to sound. I'm going to try again. Um, and everybody's just, I think people are doing the best they can, but there's always room for that improvement. Um, and talking about people in front of people. This is just something that does happen a lot in schools. And it's not even always like bad things. People are sharing positive things. But I, I give the example of, say, you know, your in-laws were at your house and your your mother-in-law says to your husband, like, she, she made the best dinner. That was so great. I just think it was so lovely how she cooked my favorite food. And you're sitting right there and you'd be like, this is so weird. Versus someone looking at you and saying, thank you so much for cooking this meal. I really appreciate you taking the time, right? Like people probably wouldn't because I have the privilege of being highly verbal and that people wouldn't talk like that in front of me, but in front of non-speaking people or people with disabilities, it happens more than we think. And so just at its core, if we can change that for students, um, I will, I, it is something that I value enough that in front of other people, I will say, I'm so sorry, we, we can't talk about this student. Um, I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to do is look right at the student and I'm going to talk to them. And it's something that I will, I will correct other adults, which is not something I, I like to do very often, but it's so central to centering the autistic perspective and showing the person you're supporting that you presume competence for them. Um, it's something that I, I, I will do. And I try to do it in the kindest, most respectful way. Um, but I just, it's really, I think it's really, really important. Um, and then ask for consent prior to providing support. So a lot of times students are, you know, there's hand over hand support given or really compliance based things where students are, are brought along in a way that might not feel good or um, I really need you to sit at the carpet. I mean, I know we're thinking about older students here today. Um, and it just, again, we wouldn't do that for someone without a disability. And so really limiting hand over hand um, to those moments where maybe it's a safety issue, right? I'm not going to let you run out into the road or whatever it might be. But I just think there's no, in, in that space of, you know, um, being restricted, being physically restrained, there's no space in that for advocacy, for connection, um, 
for engagement, right? That's a place if we're thinking about neuroception where there's probably going to be that feeling of threat and that unease. And so um, making sure that to our best of our ability, we um, we limit that. Um, and I also think that sometimes presuming competence is um, making sure that they have that access to the support. So that in the same way that Jordan um, didn't have access because her book was so limiting, um, it's being only able to say cookie versus being able to say I'm hungry, I want something to eat and having a more robust way. So without that access and dynamic communication, we're just not, we're not presuming confidence if we think that that's the limited level of communication that you're at. And so I think in our practice, thinking about are we allowing what, do we have a reliable way or access point for our students to demonstrate what they know at a high level and engage at a high level. And then that shows them that we presume confidence and we're gonna keep working on it. So in thinking about language here today and Jordan, um, I just wanted to quickly define expressive and receptive language. And these are from um, the American Speech and Hearing Association. So the ability to convey thoughts and feelings through words and gestures or symbols is expressive communication, right? And then receptive language is the ability to understand and process symbolic information. And as we saw in the documentary, those two things don't always match. And unfortunately, that sometimes is the assumption based on what a person can output people make guesses about what the person is inputting. And sometimes that means with low levels of expressive output, people assume that there is low levels of receptive language. Reversely, some students are hyperverbal. And so people think, oh, I can just chat with them and they're gonna get it. And that doesn't that's not necessarily reflective of their receptive language. So working with your speech language pathologist, working with your team to really make sure that you understand where your student is in terms of receptive and expressive um, language abilities is really key to understanding where to start with accessibility and engagement. Um, and in the documentary, right, Jordan had receptive language, but without a re reliable way to communicate other than, I mean, she she could follow directions, right? Um, she couldn't demonstrate what she knew or provide her, her reactions to what was happening to her and around her in a conventional way. And that is an experience that many of us don't have. It's not a lived experience. Um, and it, I just can't imagine it would feel good, right? And, and that's what she was able to show us. And so making sure that people have a reliable access and means to communication has direct ties to that engagement. And this documentary, I think, just shows that so well, better than like, again, anything we could say here today. So how do we support receptive language? Um, one, I, I, the first thing I, I always think about is like, what visuals have we used? People who are in meetings with me know that that's going to be the first question that I ask. Um, because when we think about autonomy and we think about presuming competence, right, we want, we don't want there to be like an adult next to someone all the time saying like, just a reminder, do this, just a reminder, do this. If I had somebody doing that to me all the time, I would be very irritated and dysregulated, but I can use my visual of a calendar and I can move throughout my day more uh, autonomously. Um, Dr. Glennis Benson has an amazing toolkit, and that, again, will be a resource that's linked, um, but it, it talks about receptive language and, again, shifts that focus to what can we do to make sure our clients um, and students understand what we're saying. So there's that quote of the biggest, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that has taken place by George Bernard Shaw. And so when we think about that, right, if we assume that someone understands everything we're saying and they happen to respond sometimes and then we get that feedback of like yep they've got it and then they fail to respond the next time um 
Dr. Benson talks about how you have to look then for an explanation for that behavior. And unfortunately, most of the time, people think it's non-compliance, right? And it's defiant or oppositional. And there are consequences. And again, if we if we reference our shared you know point of the documentary today, we can see that those didn't work and they weren't helpful and they didn't build or grow or teach skills and they didn't increase the autonomy um, that Jordan was feeling or the the connection she was feeling and and therefore there wasn't that engagement happening. Um, so how how do we support this? How do we make sure that we know that they're understanding, that clients and students are understanding? And then again, we'll talk about receptive language to make sure they have a means to advocate for themselves because compliance should never be the goal. Um, we want to protect um, our students and we wanna make sure that they have an avenue for advocacy. Um, this doesn't mean, I think a lot of times I get that back, the idea back of, well, we can't just let them do whatever they want. No. And also, if someone was forcing me to do something, right, I am much likely to enjoy it. I'm much likely to have be learning in that moment. I'm much likely to feel safe with that person. And so when we provide the right supports, a lot of times we get the same outcome. The student is engaging in the way we hoped. And so you get to that same point, but it's from a very different mindset and it's from a very different view of what the adults are doing versus what we're asking the child to do. Um, I don't know who said this. Um, and I, if someone does, please, please, please put it in the chat and give credit. But it was, it talked about IEPs and treatment plans are not necessarily what the child is going to do for us, but what the school is going to do for the child. And I take that very seriously of thinking about what are we doing to build skills for our students and making sure that our goals are not compliance based. Um, so I feel like I went a little bit off, but that's just really important. Um, so how do we um, how do we support receptive language? How do we get kids feeling good, kids kind of understanding, going back to that, that student I referenced um, from today of like, there are un, unspoken expectations. I, I can't go there, right? How do we make sure that they have what they need? Um, one is we use visuals and we'll talk about a lot of different visuals today. Two, allow for processing time. So sometimes we say, what happened? And then they don't respond right away. And we say, what, what happened? And what we know about processing language is instead of that like helping and really reinforcing the idea, um, the processing time starts over. So you actually, for a student, I had a student who I counted, and sometimes I do that during you know, an evaluation or an assessment period, of how long does it seem to take on average for the student, for the prompt to the, to the response. And this student um, was about 12 to 14 seconds. So I would ask the question and I would wait, and it's very hard. I would count in my head so that I didn't do anything. I'm sitting on my hands. I'm a fast talker. I'm, trying really hard today to not to slow down. Um, and so I would just have to wait. And then between 12 and 14 seconds, usually the student would respond with a, an on, like an on topic response. He would give me the information I was looking for. If around 15 to 20 seconds, I'm not getting anything back, then I'm thinking about how can I present the information in a different way? How can I restate the prompt, that kind of thing. But first I wanna make sure that my verbal input was given and lots of wait time. Um, supplemented with a visual is probably best. Using concrete language, we don't wanna be abstract. We wanna keep it concise and direct. And we wanna avoid sarcasm. Until you know a student really well and you know that that's like a engagement strategy that works for them and you have that relationship with them and you can do that, I would keep sarcasm out of it because sometimes it just, again, it can get lost in translation. And if we're going for, um, you know, checking for understanding, making sure that there's clarity, um, we want to take some of those factors out of it. And so um, those are some, some quick strategies. And then the biggest thing for me is we talk less and we show more. So I always say, like, even as a speech pathologist, I want to talk less, right? I want to say less because especially when our students are dysregulated, they um, 
have less access to their thinking brain and their processing. And so we want to support their receptive skills by showing and using visuals and modeling. Um, and it's just really important because sometimes when kids behavior or dysregulation, or it's looking like they're not complying, right? That word of like, they, they haven't understood and they're not, they're not showing that receptive language. Um, we might start and we're, we're starting to get flustered or maybe you're a school. Um, I always empathize, right? Like, especially with our assistants or our, our, um, our educational assistants is they're, they're trying so hard to make sure everything goes well. And so they're starting to give more input and reminders about why this is important and, oh, you're doing such a good job, just a little longer, right? But then the the input, it's just it's just building and building and it's, it's not helping. And so just quiet, calm, and then using the visuals is, is the best way. Um, one acronym or, is, um, or mnemonic is WAIT, why am I talking? Um, so that's somewhere when I worked in an elementary school, we actually put um, posters all over in the hallways and had and had that. So when kids were in the hallways and kind of having a hard moment, um, one adult could kind of reference the visuals. So we were using the visuals for our own learning um, to just kind of remember to, to stop and, and use the visuals. So. So some with the exception of video, video modeling, we're going to talk about a couple of quick um, simple tools that are all low technology and we can be created, um, they can be created digitally. Um, people, I know people like to make things really like pretty and nice and laminated. And also the like quick, I have like, you know, blank pieces of paper. I also carry around whiteboards. Um, those things are just as effective. And so I just always like to point that out of like, it doesn't have to be perfect and we don't have to complicate things. And if anything, I mean, I'm a terrible artist. And sometimes um, I will have a student like pull the whiteboard out of my hand and be like, even in a dysregulated moment, it can kind of be like disrupt their like dysregulation loop and be like, give me the marker. You can't draw that right there. They like take over or like, that's not how it went. And then they'll just, they'll just do it. So again, feeling like we have to have everything prepared sometimes takes the student voice out of it. Um, and that, and like they feeling like they can lead it. And so I, I just always like to bring back, we will talk about some things that you can prepare and create. And also on the fly, just using visuals in a very low tech way is also just, it's for sure better than nothing, right? And it might be, it might be just the, the thing that they need. So one thing, this is a um, comic strip conversations, and this is from Carol Gray. And if you're coming back in a little, one of these, another um, presentation in the series will be front with Carol Gray's team and um, social stories, but they also um, do a lot with comic strip conversations. And it's, it's my, it might be my favorite tool. Um, it really helps when we're thinking about being affirming and we're thinking about validating the autistic perspective and validating um, their lived experience. One way that you can do that in your practice and build skills simultaneously is using these comic strip conversations. It allows students to identify their own perspective. So sometimes kids didn't even know what they were thinking, right? But when they're in a regulated space and they're in a safe space, and you can see behind me actually, um, my two whiteboards that I use all the time with students. And they're, I've had a student walk in before and be like, you better get out your whiteboard for, or marker for this because we gotta, we gotta talk about stuff, right? So kids start to see that it's a valuable tool. Um, but through this process, we can show what they were thinking versus what they said. And we can talk about, was, was that a match? I don't know. Maybe was that what you meant to say, right? We can kind of build and make a plan for next time, as well as start to understand and gain information about other people's perspectives. Well, when that was happening, what do you think maybe they were thinking? Well, when I talked to them, they said this, Did, is that what you were thinking, right? And we can have a, we have a visual kind of shared, um, like joint attention, uh, a place where we can put our joint attention. And so we're not looking across at each other. I'm not interrogating. Again, I'm kind of making it so that we're just working together because I just really need to figure out what happened, right? And we can do this for a really positive thing. So I try to balance it of, you know, something really wonderful happened. Let's talk about that. And then also I heard something, it was, it was kind of hard in science today. Can, can you give me any information about that? And once you have a relationship with a student, and this is a um, 
this is a, a familiar kind of tool. I, I, kids really latch on. I just think it's such a great way for kids, again, to gain that information about nonverbal cues, potential social outcomes, perspectives of others. Um, it makes it like a visual so that we can come back to it. So if the, the story keeps changing, we can say, well, the last time we talked, it, it looks like I usually take pictures of whatever the whiteboard situation was. It looks like you were thinking this, but, but you're saying today that's different. Help me understand. Right. And so now sometimes kids will say like, oh, no, no, never mind, you know, or um, they will. They'll help you learn something different. And when you do it, when they are regulated and calm, it allows them to kind of access their thinking brain and make a plan for next time. And so I had an administrator come today and say, I did. I did it. Right. We, we talked about it. And, and then, you know, a couple of days later, it happened again. And so then we talked about it and we did the, the comic stripping and it, they were so insightful. The administrator was really complimentary. But then it, it happened again. What what should I do differently? And I said, I don't think anything, right? This is this is a really hard skill for this student and it's gonna take many, many learning opportunities. And if this administrator is the only one currently working on that or using this tool, it's gonna to take a while, right? And so how can we make sure that the people who are supporting the student across their day are also using that tool? That would be the only change. Um, and it also allows us to plan for environmental, again, if we're going back to let's reduce the load that's on our students or our clients, um, what environmental factors or supports need to be in place for them to be successful, um, this can be a great time to, to identify that, right? Of, well, if I wasn't, um, if I couldn't hear the kid chewing his gum behind me, then it, it wouldn't be a problem. Oh, okay. So would moving seats, let's look at the seating chart, would wearing headphones, right? So we can start to put some environmental things in place and maybe we, we don't even have to teach a skill that day. Maybe it isn't, it isn't, it's, it's more of a practice and advocacy. Um, and so I, I think that it's it just, again, it's a way to kind of shift the way that we're engaging with students from being, um, I'm coming in as the the teacher or the grown up or the therapist that's who's the expert and saying, I really need your help in figuring out this problem. How can we collaboratively work on that? Um, and um, if we believe what, you know, Mona Delahook and Dr. Porges are saying that behavior is a stress response to that neuroception of threat, then a consequence, just a straight consequence isn't going to work. And that's why using this and encouraging and modeling this for administrators is one of my favorite, um, my favorite pastimes. Um, because if we, if we consider the efficacy of a consequence without additional supports and skills and strategies, um, I'm not sure there's going to be a change, right? We're going to be kind of in that loop. And Dr. Ross Green, um, you know, talks about the, um, discipline to prison like pipeline, how consequences don't work, right? The kids who are in detention keep going back to detention um, and that kids do well when they can, not when they want to. And so the reason, again, I love this tool is because um, it can be done to help in, in those moments. And I will say to kids, I'm not an administrator. This happened, right? You bumped up against a boundary or a policy or whatever it might sound like. And so an administrator might be talking to, and I, I, do, I don't have any control over that. What I do have control over is working with you to make a plan or grow a skill so that that doesn't happen again, or put in a support in place for you or help you advocate so that the people around you know what you need. Um, and I just, again, and so one thing that I want to point out is I wanted to have something on a slide to show you of what comic stripping looks like. But again, I just do it freehand on a whiteboard um, and you can make it whatever you need. And a lot of times you can get the kid to kind of help draw along with you, which is really, really cool. Um, and so I, again, recommend you come back to the next part of the series um, to learn more about that. Um, the next, another tool that I like to use to clarify and to kind of support receptive language is a T-chart. And again, this is one that you can just draw on a piece of paper, a T, and it can be super low tech. Um, this was one that I used with a student who was really, they were 16, 17, and they were really interested in asking a lot of um, 
reproductive and sexual health questions. And we know that not all spaces in a school are the right space for that, but that um, was something that the student needed some clarity around. And so we were talking about, okay, well, you have these questions, those are valid. Um, we're not telling you can't, we're not trying to extinguish a behavior, but what we are doing is trying to really clarify for you um, what that looks like so you can be safe and other people can be safe. And so who are the people that you can talk to about that? And where are the places and the spaces and the people that it's not a choice right now, right? And so just kind of giving some clarity. Another thing that you can do is like, when you go to lunch today, these will be your options. These will not be your options, right? Like they were wondering about, they want pizza every day. Pizza's not on the list. That is on the no today for list. But look at, here's six things you can choose from. Or, um, so it's just what will be available, what won't be available, what's expected, what's not expected, what's provided, what's not provided. There's lots of different ways you can use T-charts. Um, but again, it's just another great tool for um, providing objective information. Um, visual lists and examples, um, you know, just really simple, writing it out, what is it? And there's, you know, for some students, younger students, it might be pictures. I will say anytime that you do pictures, try to include words because we really want to focus on um, building the literacy skills. So um, for students, because when students can type, they have the greatest amount of autonomy versus anything that's going to be programmed or created for them in terms of communication tools. And Jordan kind of spoke to that a little bit. And we um, will talk a little bit more about that when we get to the um, expressive tools. Um, on my page, it looks like the second visual did not load. Is it, can other people see that? You can see it? Okay, my computer is really playing some tricks on me today. Um, so that one is, again, it can show what it looks like to start, what you need to, what you need, and then um, what it looks like to finish, as well as who you can access for support or help. Um, and this can be a tool. Sometimes kids get stuck at certain parts of the um, initiation process or, or within the system, or they might do the project, but they don't know what it looks like to finish or how to turn it in. So again, any way that we can provide clarity so students can focus on the skills or the engagement that we are targeting is a tool or an accommodation that is um, awesome. And also these are only supportive, right? If they're given at a level that your um, client can access and understand. So if it doesn't work, sometimes I hear like, well, the visuals didn't work, right? Again, let's get curious about why and what do we need to do to change them and how can we get the learner's input so that it's a tool that's effective for them. Um, and new activities, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but New activities might require a higher level and older, familiar, routine-based activities might mean, mean need much less. Um, and that's okay. I always like to show um, this, like, like talk about Legos when we talk about universal Legos and or universal visuals. Um, Lego really like had it down, right? There's no, like they have what it look, what you need. Um, I love the ones, especially for like, I have a three-year-old. And so the, some of the younger Legos, it has a hand and it has in the hand the, what you need for that step. So it's real, it's just so visual for you of what, what do you need to do this step? And then how will it go together? And then what does it look like at the end, right? And so there's just, and it, because it's all visual, there. It just transcends all languages and there's no barriers. And it's just so accessible for so many different people. And I think like, gosh, if we can do that for Legos, gotta be able to do that for more things in society, right? Like this, this to me, is just such a great example of how it can be done and it can be done really well and people everywhere really appreciate it and benefit from. And so I also hope today you're hearing that, that all of these things really benefit everyone, right? And some students may really need them and rely on them and they may be really critical for their access and for their engagement. And other students, it just might be a bonus or maybe they're having a bad day or they're really tired and so they zoned out for a little bit and oh, there it is, now I know what to do, right? Um, so I just think that universal is so great. Um, I, video models are, um, also amazing. <laughs> and
And I think about it again is another awesome universal tool that people use all the time outside of school, but sometimes we forget about inside of our school or our learning spaces. Um, I think about my husband is can can pull up some home repair on YouTube, watch a couple of videos, and then he feels comfortable doing it, right? That wouldn't be something that would work for me. That's not in my skill set. But maybe if I watched a video about, you know, um, somebody doing a school-based strategy, I could then go and try to implement and, and um, do it. Uh, but I think that there, it's so easy, right? We all have phones of some kind. You can take a, a, a video of your phone of the student on a day where they're, they're doing it and they're doing it really well. Or we can take little clips and kind of piece them together. So we get the student over time and we put it all together to show the student doing what we want them to do, or maybe a preferred peer. Um, other examples are, you know, again, this is for younger learners, but I think you can find, you know, characters during doing certain things. Um, you know, so Daniel Tiger has great ones for getting your haircut or visiting the dentist, things like that. But there's, um, there's other characters that you can pull in and try to create as well. Um, but video models are just a really great example of, again, what it looks like to potentially start and finish as well as all of the steps in the process. Um, and when students see themselves, it can be really fun. Um, and so I think this is a great strategy for, for all. And actually, um, you know, thinking about a student who's really nervous to go to the next level of education. Um, so to so, so com community-based programming. And so what we're working with that student, but they really like creating videos. So we are having that student interview the teacher over there and they get to ask questions. They are going to take videos of those spaces um, and they're gonna to put together kind of like a, an informational video for themselves and for the other students who are transitioning from the high school level to that community-based um, center. So it's some of our students with the most high support needs. Um, and so that student is is really nervous, but they're taking on um, that creation and it's going to benefit themselves and others. So that's just one example of how you can include videos. Um, another example is just like when you make a plan with a student. Um, so often I hear like, well, I talk to them about that, right? And so when a student is calm and regulated and maybe they're in a space with you and you are someone they co-regulate with and they feel really calm and comfortable, they have access to their thinking brain. Some of those distractions or their, those dysregulating triggers are not present. They will be all in on a plan, right? And if we believe kids do well when they can, I do believe all kids want to do well. Um, and when they agree to a plan, I, you know, some adults think, well, they just agreed to it. I think a lot of times kids are really agreeing to it because they also want that outcome. But when it comes time, they forget the plan. Or they forget it. So having that um, visual and coming back to it often creates the same language across adults. So I'm working with the student during math and then the next assistant, you know, the next hour, right, we're moving throughout our day. Um, the language stays the same. So and then and maybe it could be inside of a notebook. So it's really age appropriate, right? As we as kids get older, we want to draw, we don't want to draw attention to what they need. And we want to make sure we get them and so a plan for when my brain gets stuck. Um, you know, this was a student who was having bigger behaviors and really like struggling or would just shut down for really long periods of time. And he made this plan with a safe adult. And when the teachers use it and he has that, that kind of choice and that voice in saying, I need a little more time or I'm ready. And we're not saying, oh, you get five minutes and then you have to return. We're saying you get a couple minutes and then we'll check back in. You get a couple minutes and then you either kind of are able to get ready or your body is showing that you need a little bit more and why don't you go like work with someone that you trust, right? Um, but again, there was that student voice and that choice in it. Um, more visuals that are universal of like what is expected for when you leave the class. So this um, one of these was for an eighth grade. Um, a team wanted the same um, expectations posted and in each of their classrooms. So a lot of times I know in secondary levels, something that kids say to me is really hard is going from class, you know, math to science to social studies. And every teacher has their own procedures. Every teacher has their own rules and expectations. And that's really hard, especially when you're a student who is 
you know, benefits from support in navigating those things, um, as much consistency as we can provide in working with our schools to have consistent expectations, but then having individualized ways for students to advocate within that, right? So I'm not saying every kid has to do everything the same way, but making sure that the adults have similar expectations can be really helpful in regulating for our kids. Um, and so providing universal expectations is another way that we can just support our learners. Um, here's a couple more examples um, showing how many times we're going to practice this or um, a first, next, then structure. First, we're going to math, then we're going to science, and then it's lunchtime, right? And trying our best not to say like, well, you have to do your math and then you get snack time. Instead, it's on our schedule is math and then on our schedule is snack time. We only have this much time, right? Let's work together to get it done. Let's use a visual timer. Um, we don't want to always hold out the, the carrot for students, if you will, right? We want to make sure that they have um, that they have what they need. And this is more affirming, and especially if we can work with our students to create an agenda, what is it that you're wanting to work on, especially when we're working on social skills, right? We want to make sure that their voices, that we're giving them the information they need to say, like, when you are wanting to advocate for yourself in class. Here's some tools and here's some ways you can do that. Um, but we don't want to promote masking, right? We're not like trying to, um, this is just my little plug for that, of, like for social skills, we're not going to work on eye contact. We don't want to focus on, you know, the amount of turns or that kind of thing. We want to make sure that the, the social skills are authentic to what the learner needs. So then expressing, uh, supporting expressive language. And this is, again, there were multiple modalities shown in, in the documentary. And there were various ways adults did or did not honor or validate um, Jordan and her communication attempts. And so it's really critical in our work that we provide access, we honor. Um, and I saw someone put in the chat that you're honoring both like the verbal communication as other as well as other forms and other ways that the student is showing you um, and that we're modeling. So there are different things, right? So students might be speaking, they might be mixed like we talked about, um, and they might be non-speaking, right? So those are the couple things. And there may be students who use gestures. Um, there may be some vocalizations. Um, and then there's low technology and high technology supports. And we'll talk a little bit about each one of them. Um, it's really important for me to note, just so I don't forget, that there is no prerequisite to working with a student on a robust, dynamic, augmentative tool. And we heard that in the documentary, right? Her behavior has to change before we can work on community. That just doesn't make sense, right? We need access to communication and ways to advocate for ourselves. And then we're probably going to be feeling less dis dysregulated. We're going to have more tools and strategies to, to get what we need. And it's just, it's going to be um, better. As well as like, there used to be the idea of you have to master a low tech option before you can move to a high tech option. And we just know that that's not true. Um, and the idea today is not that you're going to understand how to use all of these tools, but that you know that they exist and that you know that advocating for robust, dynamic communication for your learners is something that we can all do to really support our students and presume competence. Um, and thinking back to that presuming competence, it's not that we can just hand someone a tool and they're going to know how to use it, right? The, I hear all the time, well, they're just playing on it. I would want to explore it too. What a cool tool. I, I sometimes ask assistants that they want to take or, or case managers, do you want to take a, a, the device home? And um, there's some resources to do like adult challenges. Like, can you find, how could you say that kind of a thing so they can get acquainted with it? Because we have to model it. We, and we do that for our verbally speaking children, right? We model, model, model language and we don't expect them to talk until they're 18 months old. So again, just handing a device to a student there will be some students that can use it pretty immediately. And it's it's just an amazing, and, and there are other students that are gonna need a very, a lot of, of um, modeling and support and intervention and skill building around it. And it's just so, it's just really, really um, critical. And also modeling that tool, if you're not modeling it, but you're expecting them to use it, they aren't seeing that tool being used. It's not being communicated to them that that's a valid, um, 
like that's a value valuable way or a valued way to communicate. Um, and so it's really affirming to see other people using um, the same kind of technology or multiple modalities. Um, Project Core um, has a great website. And again, when we I keep talking about you know the, the toolkit we'll create, but um, they that's a great website for just some very um, low tech core boards to get you started. Again, something is better than nothing. Getting kids access to communication is just, it's such a critical way for us to presume competence and show them that we believe in them. Um, low tech can be great. It can be um, cheap. It can be easy. You can print it off. You can laminate it. You can send it home. You can have one in the car. You can take it to the pool, you, you know, everywhere. You could have a low tech board everywhere. I We often have them in our early childhood programs just all around the room because kids have various levels of dysregulation or language at that age, and we might you know, be able to pull a tool in and help. Um, but it's so limiting, right? And Jordan said that she's working hard as an advocate to try to make sure that kids in schools have um, access to their own communication and their own words versus just what someone else has provided for them. And so um, always collaborating with um, your speech pathologist or, you know, your local um, AT teams, like assistive technology or whatever it might be to see how can I get my student or client access to more robust communication and thinking like, does this tool allow them to advocate what they need and demonstrate what they know at a high level? And if the answer is no, then we want to keep, we don't want to be satisfied with it. And if it's a tool the student is using, we want to value it, right? So we want to do both things. And so um, high tech is not is not more valuable than low tech if low tech is the tool that the, the, the individual is using. Other like mid tech tools, I call them. Um, I don't know if that's a an evidence based word, um, but it's pre um, pre programmed messages. Again, it can be kind of limiting, right? There's only a few options here. But if we're thinking about participation and we're wanting a student to be able to share what they did over the weekend, because that's something that every kid gets to do at story time, um, we might have the we might send the the Big Mac. That's the red button. It's called a Big Mac. Um, home and have the parent um, record what they what they did over the weekend so that the child can can share in the same way that their peers are were. Um, what I always say is we want to make sure we have the information correct. If it's share day about your favorite ice cream and I don't know what the student's favorite ice cream is, I'm not going to put on their chocolate ice cream and just like hope for the best, right? That's not, that's, it's not allowing the, it's not meaningful participation for the student. And so um, if we put language on there, we have to be really confident that we're right. And so I really would look to parents for their involvement on that um, to make sure. And again, if this is the tool that the student is using, I really want to continue to be experimenting with more robust dynamic options so that they can work towards that autonomy and, and um, spontaneous language. So these are the high tech tools. And these are again, ones where you'd probably be collaborating with um, speech language pathologists, assistive technology teams, um, whatever it may be, but not always. Um, the reason why I recommend working with someone or consulting someone is not every tool or device is the right fit for the child, right? And the number of making sure that it fits with their, you know, if you work with an occupational therapist, does it fit with their motor planning skills and things like that? So we really want to be taking a comprehensive team um, based approach to this and making sure that we are including families in on this journey and that, um, Students have access always, right? So do they have access in all places? And really thinking about, and there's great tools online that um, we can get you hooked up with that help you really examine environments. Um, the set tool, that's what I was thinking of. It's it's the environment and the tech and the tool and the setting. So it's really thinking about all of those things to make sure that the child has or the student has what they need for that activity. Um, and if they don't, what do we need to kind of problem solve and brainstorm together? Um, assistive technology, augmentative and alternative communication, um, especially high tech, can be overwhelming for people. Um, people feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to model. I don't know where everything is. And I, I always 
uh, say that it doesn't have to be perfect. And you can say, I would say to kids, I haven't used this one before. Let me just take a, a look around. Is it okay if I look on your, on your device for a minute? Um, and oh yeah, that's right. We wanted to say, right. And so you're just kind of modeling out loud your thinking process that you don't have to have a full sentence either. You can have two or three words or one word. Um, and so again, I really, really recommend working with someone because that is a, a longer presentation for a different day, but just making sure that you know you're aware of those tools and that they're really valuable. And again, I think Jordan and the documentary just highlight that so, so well and the importance of, of how engagement changes when, when kids have access. A quick example that I have is um, a student did not, a non-speaking student saw them in the hallway. Um, they have a dynamic device. They've been using it since they were six. They can um, navigate it really well, um, but doesn't always bring it along um, everywhere that they need it. And often will just nod and, and is really, really good with yes, no. But um, I, I walked up and I said, how, you know, how was your weekend? And she just like smiled and nodded and the educational assistant started to say, oh, mom. And I, I kind of like paused and I said, oh, wait, you don't have your talker with you. Um, that's okay. I know that you're really good at typing. Would you mind having a conversation? And I pulled out my phone and she nodded. And I, so I typed out my question and she quickly responded back to me and we went back and forth like this. And so again, I just like to show for students again, who have access, who can type and who can spell, the world just really opens up for them in, in terms of assistive technology. And it reminds you that there's really like no excuse for students with this level of skill for not including them and not getting their input. And I could have just said like, hey, how was your weekend? And she could have smiled and I could have said like, see you later. And it would have been a positive, it would have been a fine interaction, but by really like showing her that I really, I really value her input and I really want to hear what she has to say. Um, I was kind of affirming for her that I presume competence and I think that she adds value here. Um, and the assistant, it was great, right? So sometimes people need to see tools in action before they um, can like think about, you know, using them. And so the assistant said like, oh, I wonder if I could, you know, type in the social studies question and then have her type it and then we could share, I could ask her if it was okay if I could share out or a peer could share out, right? So she was then thinking about how do I use this to enhance her engagement in a classroom setting? And I'll be honest, I don't know if they did that or not, but in that moment, it was just an easy way to kind of go through that. Um, because I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm really aware of everyone's time and respect everyone's time, I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide. Um, but I just want to draw people's attention to uh, Gestalt language processing is a, a newer term that's coming up and something to think about with both verbal communicators um, and non-speaking students who use multiple modalities to communicate. Um, it's that idea that processing language in more chunks versus the word by word level and really intonation based. And so these might be our students. We've, we've thought about this in, the, in terms of echolalia before. You might have heard that term where someone repeats something that they've heard either immediately. Um, Hi, how are you? How are you? Right. You, you hear that back or um, something from. A student was saying, just keep swimming, just keep swimming um, from uh, Finding Nemo. And that was them saying that they wanted, they were trying to tell us that they um, wanted to go swimming, right? So that was a, they were using it as a request. And so I think there is some, some narratives out there saying that echolalia or repeated speech um, sometimes is something that a kid is like stimming on. But I think that that's not the case and would highly encourage you to work with, um, again, your SLP team or whomever it may be to really try to get curious about what those phrases mean in their context to try to figure out what the student is communicating. So again, we wanna honor it and we wanna validate it and we wanna build on it um, as well as model maybe a more functional um, phrase or term that more people would understand, but we don't wanna ignore it, right? Um, and so I just wanted to kind of draw people's attention to that. And just in summary, um, when we think about all of this put together, right, we are 
providing communication supports. We are presuming competence. We're thinking about our environment. Uh, all of that is going to help students feel more comfortable and feel like they can be their authentic selves, get the accommodations they need, and not have to mask as much, right? Not have to hide who they are or kind of accommodate on our behalfs. Um, and I think um, I like this tool when we think about that is because, um, and this is from um, Supportable Solutions, but it uh, really aligns with um, the neuroception and Dr. Um, Borges's work is that we kind of talked about at the beginning and in the middle of our um, time together. But often when we are supporting students, we might have them in the flight or flight or freeze mode. And what we are really working to do is making sure we have the supports in place and the tools accessible for our students so that they get back to that green space, right? They get back to that engagement um, piece. Because I think kids do feel sometimes when they're with us in therapy spaces or you know, in an administrator's office or in a classroom, right? They might be ashamed or they might be shutting down or they might just be compensating so much that um, they just, they aren't in a place where they can learn. And so what are we doing to help shift them there? Um, and so he, again, here's just kind of like a summary of other things you can do for your environment, but we talked about a lot of them today and just, the things I didn't really talk on yet that I think are becoming more and more universal is having flexible seating options, options for movement, options for sensory strategies and tools, um, and then those universal visuals and um, communication needs. And we think, and again, I, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but when Jordan had access to some of these things, right, in her school, when she was proactively running, um, when she had the swing, all of those things, right? When she had the visuals and the AAC, her engagement really changed. And then last but not least, here are the things that if we kind of can focus on doing and working towards, I think that we will see students connecting with us and engaging with us and really being able to enter into that space of skill building and teaching. So making sure that we're following their lead and we're honoring communication and we're focused on the advocacy. Um, for our students in those skills. And thank you for coming. And I don't know if um, we'll move into questions now or if that'll be after. I know, Amanda, you have a couple more in UW. You guys have a couple more slides you want to go through. But I just um, want to thank you for sharing the space with me today. Um, this was a really neat opportunity. And um, if anything, I hope you will walk away considering um, one affirming way or strategy or care um, that you can do and that um, you found it beneficial. So thank you so much. Thanks, Anna. We're going to launch a quick poll. Um, if you could just answer a couple of questions. We're, uh, with the series, we're trying to do a little bit of impact on the learning. Um, just one question. Sorry, my apologies. Take a minute to answer that. We'll go through our ending slides, which will only take a minute or two. If you'd like to stay on and ask Anna questions, you're welcome to do that. Um, we realize that it is, it's getting late, especially if you're from the Eastern region or from another outside of central region. Um, if you'd like, if you do have questions for Anna and, um, uh, you need to get going, you can submit those to me and I can share those to Anna and we can uh, share those, we can get those responded to you. If you don't see the question, let me know. Um, it should be, it should pop up on your screen. Got it, okay. Try it one more time. I still don't see anybody answering. Do you see anyone answering? 
I just relaunched it. It should go now. I don't know what happened. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, Anna, you can go ahead and advance the slide as we're... Okay. While people are answering that. Um, so if you came to us uh, re outside of the link, if you want to just email us your full name and email address to our extension, um, our Great Lakes Rota RC email, that would be great. We'll get that put into the slide along with our website and our technical assistance um, links. Uh, that will help us make sure that you get contact hours or the, the certificate for today. Um, that would be great and make sure that you get everything that you need as far as upcoming training. Pop that in the chat for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. Um, there we go. Uh, moving on uh, to our next slide, the QR code uh, for the post event evaluation uh, oh, we'll be on sorry. The next. That's okay. <laughs> um, I was reading through the chat, and so I got, I got behind. Yes. No, that's all right. That's that's the fun part, right? Um, yeah. That'll pop up. Uh, you can go ahead and use your phone for the QR code. Um, the link is now in the chat. Um, so you can go ahead and click on that. If you could at least answer the first five questions for us, we're extremely grateful. That helps us give Anna feedback and also helps us um, plan more de professional development sessions for all of you. The last slide I'm gonna have Anna click on is um, upcoming events. Um, we are running the Know Your, Event know Your Resources series. The next one uh, coming up on February 12th is the Great Lakes Technology Transfer Center. So if you're unfamiliar with our TTCs or just wanna learn a little bit more, join us. Um, Jean Williams will be presenting. She's a dynamic presenter, lovely lady, and uh, one of our advisory board members here at Rota RC. Uh, then on Wednesday, February 15th, will be the next in our Youth Mental Health and Social Success series. We'll be talking about using scripted stories or comic book, um, comic booking, um, comic, comic stripping, sorry, comic strips um, that you heard Anna talking about. Uh, Anna will be back again. So if you liked hearing uh, from her, she will be back along with our lived experiences panel. Um, and uh, Carol Gray's team, Erin Lanou, will be presenting on that series. So we hope you will join us for that. That proves to be uh, an interesting session. So we've got two new um, series coming up in about a week's time. So that's what we've got for you. You're welcome to stay on and chat with Anna. Um, otherwise, uh, it was great.